a holographic model of flat universe. But it would be weird if it didn't have so because okay. it should have <laughs> <pull over. laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, great, yeah, thanks. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks for sticking around to the final talk. It's been a, a very fun, interesting day. I am sure we're all tired, I know I am. So this talk will be mostly pictures. Uh, if you know me, you know I'm obsessed with pictures now, with AI art. Here's uh, one example of it. This this uh, company or organization called Midjourney is by far the best one. And if you want to know how to use it, just uh, send me an email. I'll tell you how to get on there. I'm already recruiting people all over the world, including at Perimeter Institute and elsewhere. So uh, yeah, so the, the, the talk today is about ADS CFT is great. We love it. It's amazing. But can we understand something new about the way gravity works in other kinds of universes, quantum gravity specifically? And what I'm gonna be interested in here is a sort of scenario. Of course, I don't have a fully microscopic definition yet or any particular example, but we have a scenario um, which could potentially describe the way quantum gravity works in a universe like the one we see in the sky. Okay, so that universe is filled with stuff. Here's all the interesting stuff. It's homogeneous. It looks nothing like ADS space. We call that homogeneous? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you, this is, this is 100 megaparsecs. So if you go longer than that, then uh, it's pretty uniform. Okay. So I, I just flash this, uh, just say, I want to just acknowledge my very excellent collaborators. So Stefano Antonini is my student. He's graduating, going to Berkeley uh, in the fall. Peter, and Chris are Martin and Armstrong students. Chris is going to Perimeter and Peter has one more year, but they're all amazing. I definitely encourage you to invite them to give talks. And uh, yeah, Mark is like my, my colleague uh, on this stuff. And we've been thinking about this for a long time since at least a paper in 2018. Um, and I'm gonna tell you just one version of the story today uh, but there's lots of different aspects and lots of different relationships. So yeah, and, and the main point will be this is a this is going to be a theory or a scenario for the large scale structure of the universe in which we have fundamentally a negative cosmological constant. So not positive, but negative. Um, nevertheless, we'll be able to get acceleration, and um, there'll be some sort of non perturbative microscopic theory in special states. Now again, I'm, I'm going to emphasize I don't have a precise string theory construction of this. Maybe it just doesn't work. I don't know. But we have kind of the framework of what such a such a theory should look like. OK. And that's the idea. So just to remind you here, um, ADS-C of T, again, is great. It's combining quantum information with holography has taught us a great deal about space, time, gravity, black holes. I like to say, you know, it's often said there's this tension between quantum mechanics and general relativity, but somehow here they're not in tension, but actually like best friends, like one is essential for the other. But this, this progress all has been primarily accomplished in the context of these asymptotically empty space times, where as you go to the boundary, the space time empties out. And this is equivalent to the state that statement that in the CFT that's dual to this theory spates look like the vacuum once you zoom in far enough. Okay, so a question you can ask is, can we get something like a realistic cosmology using these kind of quantum information ingredients? And I wanna emphasize that it, it may be the case that you can do this, you know, with something that really is quite different from ADS CFT. We'll see here that we're gonna be a little bit different or a sort of complicated version of it. But we will still have the power of ADS CFT somewhere lurking in a in an analytic continuation of our universe. Um, but you know, I'm not wedded to this idea. It's just what we're exploring right now. Okay. So here's a cosmology, my very crude uh, picture. And by the way, contrary to what you're told about AI doom scenarios. Making these arts has actually inspired me to take up my own drawing again. <laughs> and so I challenge you to try to figure out which one are 
<laughs> Which are the pictures made by the AI. I'm pretty sure about this one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, we started out in a, a hot state of the universe, a hot Big Bang, universe expanded. And according to the sort of concordance model and the CDM, we're currently entered a phase where we're dark energy dominated with some positive cosmological constant. And this is going to cause the universe to accelerate and expand forever. So up here, there's galaxies, and we're in one of these galaxies, and the universe is just going to keep expanding forever and ever and ever. So, okay, that's great. It's a beautiful model that fits a lot of data. But we know microscopically there are still challenges here. You know, constructing string theory vacua where you have this kind of positive cosmological constant is a there are lots of attempts and uh, a very controversial literature. Even if you have such a construction, these things are often like metastable states. So in an infinite universe that's expanding forever, these states could decay. And it's really not clear, you know, what would be the quantum mechanical description of this infinite series of decays in this infinite universe. I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm just saying I don't know. And I don't think we know as a species at present. That's on the theory side. Of course, there are also now these famous observational issues like the Hubble tension. And uh, so for both the sort of theory reasons and for the observational reasons, I would think it's you know reasonable to take another look at this problem and ask whether a different kind of model, maybe a model with negative cosmological constant, could possibly explain the cosmological data set. And why negative cosmological constant? Well, again, we know a lot about ADS-CFD, so maybe if we use some of that power, we can make a little bit more microscopic sense of it. So the basic idea, let's just talk about ADS-CFD for a second. We have our CFD state here in blue at the boundary. And this is supposed to be, assuming this state is a nice so-called geometrical state, it's equivalent to some geometry here in the bulk. And as I said, this geometry is asymptotically ADS, so it's asymptotically empty as you approach the boundary in some precise sense. However, if we think about just the effective field theory in the bulk here, this effective field theory does have solutions that are cosmological, that are FRW universe, in which the universe is homogeneous and you're not asymptotic into ADS. So there's no ADS, it's just a universe like our own, very, very roughly. And here's a simple example of that. I've chosen a flat cross section. There's some radiation in the universe and there's a negative cosmological constant. And you can solve the Friedman equations in this case straightforwardly. There's a nice analytical solution. And uh, the picture of the space time is like this. You have now a big bang. You also have a big crunch. The universe expands for a while and then reaches a maximum size and recollapses. And moreover, it's time symmetric, like so. And one thing that you can show straightforwardly is that with these ingredients, you will not be able to get acceleration. So it can expand and then recollapse, but it's not going to accelerate in the expansion. Okay, but still, you know, this is like a toy model of a Big Bang, Big Crunch universe. We can ask, like, is there some way to understand microscopically what's going on? And actually, there, you know, there was an old idea that we'll kind of build off of. And the observation is that if you complexify time, then this geometry now has an ADS portion. It in fact has two ADS asymptopia, one here and one here. We start from the center, we change T to I tau, and now in this complexified Euclidean geometry, we have a Euclidean ADS wormhole between two ADS asymptopia. So now it suggests that this Euclidean wormhole could have some sort of meaning or definition in terms of some kind of coupled pair of CFTs, not completely clear exactly what sort of coupling they have. Is it a dynamical coupling or a statistical coupling? But this is the kind of thing that we're more familiar with now in the recent literature. And so maybe there's a way to make sense of this wormhole macroscopically. And then we would say that the cosmology is actually like you make a state here and you do some analytic continuation and that defines a special state for your cosmological universe. Okay, so this is the idea we want to pursue. Yeah, Andy. That's not a Penrose diagram, right? I mean, for your complexity. No, no, I'm just drawing like this is like a, I'm just drawing the size of an interval. 
It's just the size of the, yeah. Yeah, it's not a Penrose star. Penrose diagram, there's no, there's no asymptotic region that isn't singular, right? There's no asymptotic region. Yeah, it's a big crunch. Yeah, yeah, it's a big crunch. And it's totally homogeneous. Okay. So I want to just tell you two quick uh, stories. And then, yes, please. I just had a general question. Uh, do you expect there to exist a holographic dual for a cosmological, so any AFT solution? Any solution for AFT? The acceleration parameter is there. I recently heard that apparently you can't have an ex if a of t goes like t to the p, where p is greater than one or something, that's some constraint that you don't have. Oh. Do um, you have some weird constraint like I, that? I, I have no reason to think that like any a of t you could write down for some random bulk effective field theory would be a would give you some valid UV complete theory. Sure. So at that level, no, I don't know what the, the TFP business is about. You're talking about the Harvard people? Yeah, there's no good reason to believe that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> from, from a Daniel, there's no good reason to believe that. Okay, so two quick stories. One is, can we incorporate acceleration, accelerated expansion to this story? And the answer will be yes, at least the level of the effective field theory in the bulk. And part two will be, which actually came first in the papers I flashed up there earlier, is thinking a little bit about what the microscopic meaning of this structure could be, and maybe what some of the consequences of that structure would have for the cosmological physics. So first, let's talk about accelerated expansion. And so the starting point is to say that, well, we have this nice universe that's expanding and contracting. And uh, we can, with all the same symmetries, include time dependent scalar fields. That's just something that's totally allowed the level of effective field theory. So we might as well have some time varying scalar fields from the point of view of symmetry. And if we go back to our ADS CFT in complexified coordinates point of view, we know that there should be lots of scalar fields, or at least some scalar fields, around because these CFTs typically have relevant directions. And so we have some scalar field phi, let's say, that is associated with one of these relevant directions. And what that means is that this scalar field, well, first of all, it should have for its potential energy here, some negative extremum. That would be the, let's say phi equals zero, that would be the uh, ADS solution there. And then mass squared should be negative because it's relevant. And then let's just postulate some fairly generic potential. Once you turn on the scalar field by some finite amount, you would expect the energy to eventually go up again. So this is a fairly generic sort of cartoon of a potential that you might have an ADS CFT. And what I want to try to convince you is that such potential like this can, within that wormhole situation we were discussing, generically give rise to a possibly short, but nevertheless present period of accelerated expansion. So here's the argument. Let's think about what we have. So I said phi equals zero is like this boundary, ADS boundary here, right? You have negative cosmological constant. Just think of this as the potential energy, including the cosmological constant. So it's negative here. That's our ADS extremum. And what we're going to do is we're going to imagine solving the scalar equation of motion. So start from the boundary, solve inwards to this midpoint in the Euclidean wormhole. That will bring us along this blue trajectory here from the boundary to some point where the energy density is still negative, right? And now we could just keep evolving, would go back out and we'd reach the other asymptotic boundary. That's one possibility. But the scalar field is coming to rest here in the solution that we're considering. And so we could also, then do the analytic continuation, use that value of the scalar field as the source, as the starting point here in the cosmology, and then evolve either to the big crunch or to the big bang. And that would correspond to this kind of purpley magenta part of the trajectory. And the idea is that, you know, if you're starting here, say, and evolving forward or there and evolving back, you would typically have Hubble friction because the universe is expanding. But if we evolve from the midpoint and go to the Big Bang or the Big Crunch, we have Hubble anti-friction just because the universe is contracting. 
And so it's very natural that the scalar field is actually going to rise above its initial potential energy because of this anti-friction. And it could potentially reach a region of the potential which is positive, like so. And if it were also the case that it reached this region of positive potential moving slowly enough, then it could be that the energy of the skater field is potential energy dominated, and then you would have the ingredients you would need for some accelerated expansion. And so the, the claim here is not that every potential does this, but that first of all, these negative mass squared scalars have kind of the roughly right ingredients to have this physics. And that if you did have it for some particular potential, it would be generic. So if you change the potential parameters a little bit or change the initial condition of the scalar field at the center of the universe a little bit, you could find another solution nearby where you still have a period of acceleration. So in other words, this is like a generic new mechanism or a difference mechanism for generating acceleration, where it's a coming from these time dependent scalar fields that naturally arise in uh, ADS CFT when the CFT has relevance directions. Okay, so let me just show like you can just pick a potential. I don't claim it's a particularly physical one. It's a sort of exponential potential. The axes here are finite, which is the value at the midpoint and G, which is some parameter of the potential. I've chosen the mass squared to be right at the BF bound. And if you just solve the Friedman equation and ask, is there a period of acceleration where A double dot is greater than zero, this red shaded region is all the place where we could detect that in the numerics. Okay, and indeed it's co-dimension zero in the space of parameters. And that's what I mean by generic, right? I don't necessarily mean it's common, or that every potential does it, but if you do have a point here that's doing it, then there's some neighborhood around it where acceleration is still happening. What are the axes? The axes are phi naught, which is the value of a spitter field at the midpoint, and G, which is just some parameter that tunes the potential. So I didn't write down what the potential was, but it's a simple, like, it's E to the G phi squared, some kind of exponential potential. Brian, once the, once the, the once you reach the positive uh, part, yeah, you know, that just continue forever. Yeah, I mean it depends on the details. Um, it, it it you know the scalar field can it it will keep moving and it can be maybe kinetic energy dominated or there's different possibilities. I mean it doesn't keep accelerating forever typically. Like it typically will stop. And uh, what happens here is is I think model dependent. Mm -hmm. But part of the message is that sort of interestingly, we don't really need to be saying anything about what's going on at the big bang or the big crunch. We're sort of reasoning from the center of the universe rather than from T equals zero or T equals infinity or you know, T equals big crunch. Okay. So the claim is that if you had this kind of setup for a generic CFT with relevant perturbations, you would expect generically to have this accelerated period. And then we showed in one of the papers, not surprisingly, if you sort of fine tune the potential, you can match say the scale factor of lambda CDM to sort of whatever degree you like more or less, right? While being consistent with the wormhole solution. Those potentials might be bad for various reasons. They might be in swampland, I don't know. That's a harder question, but at least the tunability is there at the effective field theory level. Okay, so now let me comment on um, what the microscopic meaning of this wormhole could be. And again, the idea is it's gonna be two three-dimensional CFTs coupled by some sort of auxiliary system. And uh, the cosmology is gonna be dual to a special state in this auxiliary system. So let's see how that works. So here's the picture I wanna have in mind, Euclidean picture, everything's Euclidean. This is a, R3 that goes on forever up and down and out of the page <coughs> and in some other direction. This is an interval, it has some finite size. So these are two 3D theories. These are my 3D CFTs. This is some four dimensional quantum field theory of some type, not necessarily holographic that couples these things together. And the idea is we wanna imagine that there's a, a combination of theories and parameters for which 
what happens when you couple the two 3D theories via this 4D thing is that it triggers an RG flow that ultimately couples these theories together or sort of confines them together in some way, okay? And since these are holographic theories, we would write that coupling or confining as a wormhole that connects these two different CFTs. And so just to emphasize again here in the blue, there is no gravity, but in the gray region, there is gravity, right? So this is my emergent Euclidean wormhole. Okay, so suppose we had such a picture, then what would be the interpretation of our cosmology? Well, there's two different ways of slicing this path integral. And here I'm using my cosmology color pen in uh, PowerPoint. So one of them is if I slice kind of along the long way, parallel to the three dimensional degrees of freedom. So this, when I open the path integral up, only exposes four dimensional degrees of freedom. No three dimensional degrees of freedom are touched by this slice. So this is really a state in the Hilbert space of the 4D theory on R3, right? And I claim that if you just look at the, like you imagine this slice going down, this is also cutting the wormhole. And the place it's cutting the wormhole is right at this midpoint in time. So this is like saying that there's a state of this 4D theory, a special excited state. Why is it excited? Well, I have some kind of boundary here and then I'm evolving for a finite amount of Euclidean time. So it's not infinite time. It's not a ground state, it's an excited state. And it's an excited state of this 4D theory that is sort of entangled with this cosmological universe. So this would be like a sort of version or realization of the islands and cosmology story. And um, so this cosmology is actually not coupled directly to this 4D theory, but it's just a representation of this special, highly entangled state that you have. Sorry, Brian, in, yeah. the, in the right figure, between the two is Euclidean time, or, or what is that direction? Yeah, this is Euclidean, this is Euclidean, Euclidean. and then I'm going to continue it to real time. Right, so it's like a, you know, roughly it's like a bell pair or a bunch of bell pairs I'm making between the universe, the cosmology universe here and my my 4D theory. Here. Brian, is there supposed to be a space time in between this line, this sheet and that sheet or is those are just different? No, I mean, there's a different version of the story where the 4D theory is also holographic. Uh -huh. Then you can fill this in. Uh -huh. And this is like an end of the world brain. Okay. Yeah, so that's like a special version of this. Yeah, but yeah, it's it's useful to think about that that uh, special case um, for various reasons. That's where we started actually was thinking about this doubly holographic setup. Okay, but it's interesting in this. Uh, I think it's interesting that there's also an alternative slicing, where now I slice in a way that cuts open the three D degrees of freedom, as well as the four D. So if I slice it in this way, I have these two 3D systems exposed now, and now the 4D theory, not on R3, but on an interval times R2. And if I kind of draw this analogous thing here, it's like cutting the wormhole this way. And then because this is an infinitely extended direction, this is actually dual to a ground state of this 4D, 3D, 3D coupled thing. Right, we have the two edges and this 4D thing, and it's some sort of coupled ground state of these, these three theories. And we actually know what this looks like. And in fact, it's a, it's a wormhole, it's a Lorentzian wormhole, which is traversable and internal. So you can go back and forth between the two sides sort of as much as you like. And it's really a ground state. So this traversal wormhole is like describing the ground state of this coupled, this coupled <laughs> things. Okay, and this is why we called in one of the papers uh, was, was called cosmology from the vacuum, because essentially we have a vacuum state here, which via this somewhat complicated series of continuations is secretly encoding the observables of a, of a cosmology. Okay, so great, that's the idea. That's the framework. Again, there's no concrete theory which does all these things at present. Of course, we're thinking about that. But suppose this were a roughly correct picture of the universe, what would this bias? And um, 
Well, one thing is that it, it offers new perspectives on cosmological puzzles. And I want to be very careful here. I'm not claiming to solve any problems yet. Like Leonardo, I have grand ambitions, but uh, but we're not there yet. But what what could we hope to address? So you know, what, one puzzle that people sometimes talk about is uh, this question of why is dark matter and dark energy of roughly the same size at present in our universe? And um, from the point of view we're discussing here, there is a sort of different explanation of this, which is that at the midpoint of the universe, assuming you only have matter and your cosmological constant, the, the midpoint condition just tells you these things have to match up. Okay, and so then for a lot of the lifetime of the universe, they're gonna naturally be of roughly the same order, just because that's where, you know, they're starting equal and they're not evolving too much. And so it's actually pretty reasonable for them, you know, to be roughly the same size for most of the time. And maybe that's where we see ourselves is in some most of the time part of the universe. Uh, another interesting point is, okay, there's a very famous issue of horizon puzzle, right? How do we see correlations on the sky between regions that were seemingly out of causal contact? Yeah, Andy. In your first blue bullet, of course, I guess the uh, astronomical evidence, which might be wrong, is, is or misleading, is that it spans forever and we're not at a turning point. But let's suppose that we were at a turning point. Are, are you trading it for another problem is why are we now exactly at the turning point of the universe? Uh, good. I'm, I'm not saying we're exactly there. I'm just saying that at that point, they're equal. And for most of the lifetime of the universe, by some measure, they're kind of close to each other, like within a factor of 10. Because uh, when you're not, you crunch. Right. Because when you're not, you, you know, so as long as A is, you know, yeah, yeah. We're not like having to fine tune things at the Big Bang to arrange it so that you know, when the universe is much, much larger, they happen to be exactly the same. So it's a, it's, I think it's a better, I think it's better than, than, well, than, yeah, than the equivalent puzzle and a winning trade. Yeah, it's a winning trade. Except for the part where we all die. <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> we'll just handle it it's far enough through. in the future. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we just, uh, yeah, there's lots of ways out of this. You just need to put eyes in the right place. Um, I'll just comment. There's a forthcoming, we sort of pointed this out in one of our papers, but there's a forthcoming new work by a subset of the authors, Mark and Chris, in which they sort of observe that if you're just trying to fit supernova data and you allow yourself to say, consider a linear potential, that it's really not ruled out to have a scalar field that's varying by a significant amount. And sort of the reasons roughly because we don't have very good direct observational evidence about how much matter is in the universe. And so for this reason, it turns out there's like a lot of freedom in fitting this data. And so you really need to invoke CMB to say something stronger, but just from the sort of the scale factor measurements in the recent history, um, it will be compatible with models where we've actually already started to stop accelerating. Okay, so maybe we're already on our way to the, to the crunch. I mean, to be clear, though, this is like you uh, are you saying I, I would have guessed that you can't explain the CMB this way. Is that wrong or can you? Or? Uh, it's not clear. I mean, actually, you can get structure, I think, where this is something we're working on. You, you can get peaks and so forth. I'm not saying you can get the peaks that match the peaks that they see in the sky yet. But getting peaks is not necessarily a problem. Mm -hmm. And in, in terms of this horizon thing, which is what I was mentioning, you know, there is now a sort of alternative reason why you could have long range correlations because there's secretly this ground states description of your system. And as we know very well, ground states can have long range correlations because they've kind of been evolved for infinite imaginary time. So again, I want to be very careful. I'm not claiming that we've solved this issue in a new way, but there's potential for something for a new perspective. Maybe it's complementary to inflation. Maybe it's an alternative to inflation. I don't know but it, there seems to be room for something interesting here. Another interesting thing is to ask how the arrow of time evolves and uh, emerges in this story. And this is a subject that people have thought a lot about in the past. One scenario would be that there is a, essentially a, a superposition of two different arrows of time, one that goes forward and one that goes back. Actually, there's a great sci-fi story 
where the author imagines that when you get to this midpoint, you just like stop evolving and then you start unevolving after that point. So if you want to send me an email, I'll, I'll send you the story. But um, this is maybe one plausible way of understanding how the arrow of time works. So if we're sort of in a branch of the wave function here with some particular configuration of stars and galaxies and so forth, as we evolve forward, we don't see anything particularly special happening at this point. We continue to maintain our error of time, but maybe there's some other universe, some other branch where they're seeing the error of time go the opposite way. And just as a fun toy model, you can try to build a, a toy version of this setup where you can actually see this physics. And um, this, this toy version is what are called in quantum information world history states. And in quantum gravity, the Page Wooters approach. There's lots of literature on this, but the basic idea is you have like a system and a clock and the history state is some kind of entangled state between system and clock where the clock and the system tracking their evolution. So system at time T is correlated with clock at time T and you sum over all these versions of T. There's a nice Hamiltonian you can write down which kind of like a quantum constraint that forces states to have this form. And then there's a Hamiltonian, it's called the history state Hamiltonian, where you sum over all these terms kind of in the middle, which say that the state should evolve in this correlated fashion. And then you can also put boundary conditions at the infinite past or some, some past point and some future point, which say that the, um, the state should have a particular value there. And in some work in progress, we've been playing with this toy model a little bit. Suppose you, you know, imagine the system is, uh, say, a random matrix. There was a plasma in the distant past, so it should presumably be kind of quantum chaotic, and so maybe a random matrix is not a, not a terrible model. And so let's like make the system Hamiltonian a random matrix. And then if we just have this first term, then the history ground space is actually very degenerate. Any initial state leads to a valid history state. Similarly, any final state leads to a valued valid history state. If you have one, plus two or that should be three, but I guess it's fine. One plus two or three, then you have a unique history state, which is basically saying that you specify either the initial condition or the final condition, and then the rest of the state follows from that. But if you have one, two, and three, which is what you'd have if this was a time reversal symmetric Hamiltonian with time reversal defined in the natural way, then unless two and three were somehow fine tuned so that initial state equals final state, you don't actually have an obvious exact ground state of the Hamiltonian anymore. But what it turns out occurs, at least in numerics, and we can make a model of this by projecting onto the special set of states, is that the ground state of the Hamiltonian now spontaneously breaks time reversal and is in fact a superposition of a forward going branch and a backward going branch. Okay. So this some kind of frustration? Yeah, it's essentially, it, you know, it, it, wants, it wants to have a certain value at the initial point and a certain value at the final point, and the solution is to make a cat state where it superposes those two options. And you can do numerics to see this and then analytically calculate the gap by projecting onto these two special states that are forward going or backward going. Okay, let me make another comment. Um, about enhanced negative energy. This is a wormhole. You can see that the background of space is different here. So you're going to a, a different star, some kind of three planet system. I don't know, this is very interesting. Um, if we're you know, in this Lorentzian wormhole picture, the vacuum slicing, we need a large amount of negative energy to support the traversable wormhole. And you could ask, you know, is that feasible? Is that something that quantum field theory can do for you? Um, it's not obvious that it is possible. Uh, Mark and Peter and Alex May wrote a nice holographic version of this setup where they could show that you could actually generate very large amounts of negative energy in this bottom up holographic model. And then Mark and I wanted to know, well, what about like a UV complete quantum field theory that we understand everything about like Dirac fermions? Could we also generate large amounts of negative energy there? And in a paper that we posted uh, late last year, we sort of argued that the answer is actually yes, you can find states 
of a Dirac fermion in three plus one dimensions, valid continuum quantum field theory states, as far as we could tell, where the energy density on a strip of some characteristic size is first of all uniform and can be arbitrarily negative compared to the vacuum energy in the Minkowski space. Is so it infinite strip? It's infinite strip this way, but has a finite length this way. And so you can compare the energy density you're getting here to say the Casimir value, if I identify the ends of these strips. And as we know well, for the fermion, the Casimir energy is just some number with pi's and zetas and so forth, just some order one number. And what we argued is that you can make states where the negative energy is as much bigger than that number as you'd like. Okay. And I can tell you afterwards if you want to know how we how we argued for that. But there is kind of a catch. It's not, it's not, well, there's a there's a caveat, which is that these states are not time independent states. The negative energy actually starts to evolve and rush towards the boundary. So they're not equilibrium states. <laughs> But nevertheless, it does seem like you can construct states where the energy density is uniform and as negative as you like in three plus one. It's not true in two plus one or one plus one, but in three plus one, it's true. Wait, so does this mean the Hamilton is not bounded below? Well, it's a, it's on a in, interval, right? With open boundary conditions? Well, that's, that's, that's the philosophy. We don't say anything about what's happening outside. Energy right? is defined as the integral of two zero zero. That's right. This region. That's right. So we know for a field theory in Minkowski, right, there are strong constraints. If you integrate the negative energy along a complete um, you know, null line, but we know much less about what happens if you just have some patch, right? So of course this has to be compensated by some physics outside, but that's fine. We don't, we don't really care about that. We just wanna have a lot of negative energy in one place. Okay, and I want to wrap up with one more. Oh, there's another picture. Yeah, this is me. Um, this is the place you can go if you have a large amount of negative energy. Um, <laughs> one of the places. Um, so let me just like throw out one more wild idea, which is this idea of Extended quantum Church-Turing thesis. What is this about? Well, what's the Church-Turing thesis? It says roughly that any physical model of computation can be simulated by a Turing machine, right? That we, at least I think is probably true. I don't think we know a counterexample. Importantly, we're not asking for efficiency there. So it can simulate quantum mechanics because it just takes exponentially long time to do it. No problem. The extended means you ask it to be efficient. So extended without quantum we think is wrong because quantum computers exist. So a classical Turing machine can't efficiently simulate a quantum Turing machine. And so extended church Turing thesis is wrong. The quantum extended church Turing thesis says, well, maybe a quantum Turing machine can efficiently simulate any other physical process. All right, that's the idea. Um, you know, that seems fairly plausible, I would say, but it, I think it is a physics question. And in particular, from the point of view of what I told you here, there's, there's kind of an issue, which is that I said that the cosmology was dual to this particular special state that I obtained by Euclidean evolution. And it's, it's far from obvious that this state is a state that you can prepare efficiently. It, it, it's something you get by Euclidean time evolution, not real time evolution. And Euclidean time evolution is actually not something that's easy to implement using unitary operations typically. And even if you had this state, it's not really clear how you figure out what the observable physics in the cosmology is. And it's not clear that that's something you can do efficiently, right? So maybe from this point of view, if this really was the microscopic description of our universe, it might be that you actually can't make this state or probe this state in an interesting way efficient. And so maybe it would violate this We're extended. Monte Carlo. Yeah, well, but maybe it has a sign problem. Okay. People also consider these kind of states in the context of tensor networks. They were called METs, multi um, minimally entangled typical thermal states. Uh, they use them to do thermal physics using tensor networks in 1D. 
But actually, they can be very highly entangled, especially in higher dimensions. And so it's really actually very unclear what's going on here. And actually, if you do the doubly holographic version of what I was telling you, these states are microstates of a black hole, and the cosmology lives behind the horizon on some end of the world brain. And so there's really, it's really unclear whether you can actually read off that physics or even make that state in an efficient way. Let me have some argument for why church join has to be violated inside of black hole horizons. Yeah, and then he says it's fine. Yeah, he went back and forth a few times. I don't know what the current status is. Yeah, I don't know what the current status is. I mean, I, I think a possible way out here is that, you know, we live here, not there. So maybe... For... That's the way out of Lenny's thing. <laughs> Lenny's thing requires you to, like, upload your brain into the corner. Right, right, right. So, you know, if um, you do that here, then... Uh... Yeah, yeah. So, you know, we live here. Maybe we can sort of describe physics here efficiently using a quantum procedure. I don't know. Another possible way out is this, this alternative ground state picture. Ground states are often much easier to prepare than these kind of weird thermal pure states. And so maybe from the ground state point of view, it's easier to figure out what's going on in the cosmology. And we actually wrote a paper about extracting, say, the scale factor from measurements in this, boundary measurements in this ground state setting. OK, so I think that's good enough. This is an exponentially complex universe, as imagined by the AI. It doesn't look that complicated to me. So I don't know. Take it for what you will. And yeah, just to wrap up, so what I told you is a sort of scenario or framework for making sense of cosmology like we see in our own universe. Uh, one of the key points is that in this picture, the cosmology is encoded as the some kind of complex quantum state of an auxiliary 4D theory that's not talking to the cosmology directly at all. I tried to show you that there's some different perspectives that are interesting on sort of flatness problem, coincidence problem, horizon problem. Actually, I didn't talk about flatness, but you can just talk about that. But there's lots of questions. So uh, like Leonardo, I will appeal to you to get involved. There's lots to do. In particular, you know, understanding the physics of perturbations, whether we can possibly match what we see in the CMB. You know, if we're getting ambitious, could we say something about the Hubble tension? You know, the scalar sector has other interesting predictions. It might predict light particles. Could those be dark matter? You know, we're getting very ambitious now. You know, and then, you know, microscopically, can we find stringy constructions that realize these sort of wormholes? Even if it's not exactly like our universe, I would consider it a triumph to have some sort of stringy description of this big bang, big crunch setup or any sort of interesting uh, evolution. Okay, so thanks a lot. It's dinner time. Okay. No questions? Good. Okay. Great. Let's thank Diana.